Okay, I think we are live. Hello, everyone. I hope you're all doing well. Welcome to our live session. Uh, we're so glad that you are here with us today. Um, the reason Dean and I wanted to go live today was because today is World Alzheimer's Day. Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us in CS? Thank you so much. Um, hello, hello. Good to see you all. Hi, Roxanne. It's good to see you. All right. So I think um, it's important for us to introduce ourselves because over the past couple of months, we've had so many new friends um, join our Instagram page, our, our Facebook page, and on YouTube. So I'm just going to give a brief introduction. So uh, Dean and I are both neurologists and scientists, and that basically means that we uh, see patients in the clinic. Um, I see them in the emergency room and in the hospital and the ICU setting as well because I'm a stroke neurologist. And we're also scientists, which means that we study um, Alzheimer's disease and brain diseases in general. Where uh, I'm an associate professor of neurology, which means I have the privilege of teaching medical students. And Dean's, Dean is a professor of neurology at Charles Drew University and UCLA. And we're both the co-directors of um, the Brain um, Health Institute, where we see patients and we evaluate them. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, um, thank you for all of your questions. I have a bunch of questions that we need to go over and uh, um, speak with you. So if you have any questions, please um, feel free to uh, post them here on the questions. Hello, Becky. Hello, Jenny, Joyce. All of our members from Neuro Academy have joined as well. Wonderful. So good to see you all. All right. So <clears throat> I think one of the questions that I would like to ask you, Dean, to, to start off this, uh, this live session is, the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease, that was one of the most common questions that was asked. And I think it's relevant for us to kind of start with, uh, with that. Absolutely. Uh, dementia by definition is the umbrella category, the big category, like for example, uh, cancer is being uh, the bigger category and Alzheimer's is a subtype of dementia. Mm -hmm. Same thing as liver cancer, or prostate cancer being a subtype. Um, there are many types of dementias. Uh, there's Alzheimer's disease, which has, constitutes about 60 to 70% of all dementias. But there are vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal lobe dementia, Huntington's dementia, and many others as well. The dominant one, the predominant one is Alzheimer's, and it's the one that's uh, uh, growing rapidly and the one that we are addressing um, on a regular basis now uh, because we're becoming more familiar with it as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's a great answer. Um, um, and... Um, can you tell us a little bit about some of the other types of dementias that are not like Alzheimer's disease, but then <clears throat> eventually they, you know, most dementias end up looking the same. They do. By that, what we mean is they initially start with, uh, distinctly different, both pathophysiologically, meaning the underlying processes underneath, um, whether it's a certain kind of proteins that accumulate in Alzheimer's, such as amyloid and tau, or um, uh, synuclein proteins and um, Lewy body proteins and Lewy body disease and others. And, and they start with particular kind of symptoms, unique symptoms early on. For example, for Alzheimer's, the early symptoms for the great majority is memory, short-term memory, disproportionate to long-term memory. So a lot of patients come to me and say, you know, I'm fine, Dr. Sherzai, I can remember, you know, 50 years back, it's just I'm having difficulty with breakfast. Well, that's the, that's the distinguishing factor that all of a sudden now short-term memory has become a problem. So short-term memory, visual spatial difficulty at the beginning is most likely, although that's not, uh, that needs to be furthermore worked up, but is most likely Alzheimer's type. Lewy body dementia manifests in different ways. It has both movement disorder, Parkinsonian symptoms, and cognitive issues and memory, things of that nature at the same time. Parkinson's dementia uh, alternatively is Parkinson's symptoms, which are movement disorders, tremors, difficulty with gait and balance. But then several years later, you see the beginnings of cognitive and memory issues. Mm -hmm. Frontotemporal lobe dementia has a couple of categories, uh, language disorder, disproportionate to everything else, and executive function, meaning ability to make decisions, um, ability to inhibit and stop yourself, uh, disinhibition, doing things that they would have never done before, or not knowing how to do simple things like programming the, the TV, mm. although that's not so simple. But let's now do. it is, especially with all these complicated uh, remote controls. We sound like, you know, like we're very technologically challenged. We're not. Well, she's definitely not. <laughs> no, but I but, but uh, so that's those are the distinction. There are many others as well. But later on, as the diseases progress, they start involving all of the brain, all of them. So 
as the disease progresses, when it gets past a moderate to advanced stage, they all pretty much start looking the same. Uh, that's the distinction. Absolutely. I'm going to read from <clears throat> um, the papers you know, that I have here, but I'm also going to take some questions from Instagram and Facebook. Um, I think our friend Easy Breezy, I hope, I hope I said it right, um, says, do genetics play a role or can dementia diseases be prevented by lifestyle modification? A wonderful question. Um, so genes are involved in everything even human behavior. We're, uh, we've done a podcast and we're going to do a more extensive podcast as far as how even behaviors are influenced by genetics. Yeah. But genetics have different penetrances, meaning that the, the amount of influence that genes have in particular disease varies. For example, Huntington's disease is a 100% penetrant genetic disease. Mm -hmm. It's a chromosome. On chromosome 4, one little allele is affected. And when a person has that disease, when you see that genetic uh, aberrancy, abnormality, you know almost 100% uh, certainty that the person is going to develop the disease in their 30s or 40s. Yeah. And it's an incredibly sad thing. And it's incredibly important for people to know that because then they can actually have um, conversations with their family. But mm. for a lot of other diseases, it's a combination of genes and environment. For Alzheimer's, the percentage of Alzheimer's that's determined by 100% penetrant genes, meaning that if you have these genes, you're going to definitely get Alzheimer's, is only 3 to 5%, meaning only 3 to 5% of Alzheimer's cannot be avoided. Right. And those genes are amyloid precursor protein, presenilin 1, and presenilin 2. Correct. Those are unusual in unusual populations in Venezuela and other places. You go and see entire families in their uh, 40s, uh, 50s developing Alzheimer's. And they're also called early onset uh, Alzheimer's, and, 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 and they're, they're distinct. Now, the next penetrant genes in Alzheimer's is APOE4. And many people have heard about APOE4, especially with the actor Chris Hemsworth being so open um, about his own situation and also sharing with everybody else, uh, which helps promulgate and yeah, spread information. Absolutely. APOE4, which is the most dominant gene that you hear about Alzheimer's, even there, if you have one gene from one parent, your risk goes up three to four times. If you have two genes, one from each parent, your risk goes up, goes up as much as 12 times. But literally 50% of people that have both genes never develop the disease. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that gene, for the most part, is a lifestyle gene yeah. or a gene that has to do with lipid metabolism, fat metabolism. There is a clue. Um, although they, that gene has multiple other functions as well, but fat metabolism and transport is a big part of it. And APOE4 does a poor job. Mm -hmm. APOE2 APOE2 does a great job. So they are protected to a great extent. APOE3 is a wash. APOE3 right. is a wash. Now, the, there are about 30 plus other genes that have been associated with Alzheimer's. They have lower penetrance, meaning that they influence prevalence of Alzheimer's, but it's more about what lifestyle factors and their interplay with those genes that matter. Right. So as you can see, a great proportion of Alzheimer's and also many other dementias is influenced by environment and lifestyle and their interplay with your genetic risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Okay, next question. How common is Alzheimer's disease? So, you know, we <clears throat> we use it interchangeably with dementia, but we know yeah. that 60 to 70% of dementias are, are Alzheimer's disease. How common is it right now? It's fairly common. I mean, we're talking about uh, 6.8 to 6.9 million Americans today have dementia and and we're worldwide the numbers are rapidly growing yeah. in in many countries it's not a uh, well diagnosed because uh, in in those countries and even in the united states in certain populations when they develop dementia because there is not information well distributed in those populations when the elderly person develops dementia they say oh it's that's just part of uh, aging mm. and it's not but they're not diagnosed yeah. so it's an underdiagnosed disease better in the united states than, than other countries but still it's very underdiagnosed especially in certain populations mm -hmm. like i said 6.9 million americans and it will be significantly higher by 2040 uh, uh, and 2050 in fact it's the number one cause of mortality morbidity in the U.S. and it's the number one cause of mortality morbidity in Japan and uh, sorry in, in Japan and, and UK and other places in U.S. By the way, uh, it's going to be number one fairly soon. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's rapidly number five rising. right now. It's number I five think. right yes. now. Yes. Yes. Um, and I, I just to kind of elaborate on that point that you discussed about you know some people not even getting diagnosed. So there are. Uh, there are certain people um, from different communities that think that having memory problem is just a normal 
part and parcel of getting older. And so if, say, for example, if a mom and a dad or a grandfather or a grandmother has memory problems, their children and their relatives don't usually do much about it or they don't seek help and they consider that as a normal part of life. And I think that's a big impediment in getting the right kind of care at the right time, prevention, detection, early detection, and even management of the risk factor that can propagate the disease. So yeah. for example, if if someone has memory problems at that stage, at that early stage of mild cognitive impairment, there's so much that can <clears> be done. That memory problem may be due to abnormal glucose metabolism. Maybe they're diabetic. Maybe their cholesterol is very high. Maybe their blood pressure is very high. Maybe their vitamin B12 levels are low, or maybe vitamin D level is low. And so the, addressing those early signs of memory impairment is very important. We're not trying to fear monger anything because, you know, everybody forgets. I mean, the number of things that you, <laughs> you and I forget is massive, you know, especially when we all lead such busy lives. Um, you know, misplacing keys and forgetting a specific appointment, so on and so forth. But, you know, if it consistently happens on a regular basis, I think it's very important for pe people to get evaluated because at an early stage, there's so much we can do. But early, uh, early symptoms are important to know, even if they're not related to dementia, other things might be affecting memory that are also avoidable. We know that uh, we, we always say that um, attention is the gatekeeper of consciousness. Attention is the gatekeeper of cognitive function. If attention is affected for prolonged periods of time, and we will have conversations about this, mm -hmm. uh, it has profound effect from the sympathetic overdrive to uh, cortisol overdrive to how it damages the brain over time, but also how it affects memory and cognition over time, and also how it actually pushes the brain towards risk of developing dementia. Okay. So for the younger people who think they're they're not going to be affected by this, by knowing that you could, by knowing that by doing some simple things, you can significantly reduce your risk, that's where we will have done the best work. And, and the answer is not some gimmick. You don't need to put some kind of butter in a coffee or some, some uh, pill combinations or some juicing. No, it's simple, free things that profoundly reduce your risk, but it should be started earlier. Now, the brain gives you incredible capacity to recover even later, even after traumas. Mm. But why not start earlier uh, when 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 so much can be done? Absolutely. Great, great points. All right. So I just wanted to bring up the point that women tend to have higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Two thirds of Alzheimer's patients are women. And it's also higher among people of color. So Hispanics and African-Americans have about three to four times higher risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And, and one of our friends actually asked, why <clears throat> is that? Why is it that people of color have higher risk? And it's not genetic. And we, the, uh, as part of our non-for-profit, which is Healthy Minds Initiative, we work in, 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 in all communities, but especially communities that don't have access to information. Remember that in real estate, it's all about location, 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 and public health, it's about access, access, access access to information resources and and uh, healthcare and and uh, so we we go and try to promulgate and spread information about uh, these things it's critical and it's it's lifestyle yeah. it has to do with lifestyle um, yeah downstream is blood pressure cholesterol diabetes uh, vitamin deficiencies and things of that nature but how are they affected how can how can they be affected early on or even after the fact mm -hmm. it's nutrition exercise and other things that we'll be talking about, but simple things that a community, a population, a family can institute, small steps that has profound effect on your brain health. Mm -hmm. I want to get back to the previous thing about gimmicks. Social media is full of gimmicks because that gets attention. Literally, they tell you, Definitely. grab people's attention. Well, grabbing people's attention with bone broth and some unusual this and that, it, it's, it's, it's going, you're going to get a million people but you're going to also do this service to a million people. Simple uh, factors that can uh, uh, that can be translated across populations throughout the world, which we've worked in, are so much more powerful. So uh, that's some of the things that we actually teach in our communities, in our clinics, and um, uh, throughout the world. Right, absolutely. Um, there are some women who are actually having a conversation in our in our group, and I wanted to say women tend to have higher risk of Alzheimer's disease for multiple reasons. I think it's multifactorial, which means it's not one thing. It's not just lack of sleep. It's not just stress. It's not just you know hormones. It's multiple different things. And um, we actually were involved in in really cool research to understand it better. But it seems to be 
at uh, you know uh, at the juncture uh, juncture of uh, vascular risk factors, the change from mary, many perimenopause to menopause to postmenopause, that that massive shift that women go through during cognitive menopause. challenge. The lack of cognitive challenge compared to men from the older uh, cohorts that we've studied. Not in the younger ones, obviously. Not in the younger ones. That's definitely changing, which is a plus <clears throat> point and a protective point. Um, and so it, it has to do with that. Um, a lot of people think that because women tend to be mothers and they have children and they don't sleep and because of the stress, that may actually be pushing them towards Alzheimer's disease. The studies actually show otherwise. Which is surprising. That uh, the, So it's perception. Right. It's a completely different subject here as well. Perception of stress and management of stress is more of a factor than the thing in itself. Absolutely. Than the stress in itself. Yeah. And we'll have conversations about that as well. Absolutely. Which well, is a very cool concept. Very, very cool concept. And uh, <clears throat> hopefully we're actually doing an, um, a, a podcast on this subject yes. very soon. By the way, if you, uh, if you please listen to our podcast, we've got many, many conversations. Yeah. Brain Health Revolution and uh, yeah. Uh, the, the link is in our bio and there are <clears throat> multiple different conversations we've had about Alzheimer's disease, prevention, and other neurodegenerative diseases as well. All right, Dean, I'm going to ask you a very controversial question. This is something that has kind of caused a little bit of a stir and it's made our life a little difficult on social media because of just like this, um, not people not really accepting this. Mm -hmm. Can we reverse Alzheimer's? No. Um, and this is very important to us because... Um, uh, when we deal with patients and we both met, our first conversation was about a, our two grandparents each who had Alzheimer's. We recognize how painful it is when you see a family member go through this and how much you are actually uh, vulnerable to people that are trying to um, um, uh, do schemes and uh, build, uh, you know, make money off of your hopes. And, and it's critical that, that we speak clearly about this. Mm -hmm. uh, when we wrote our, actually both books, we were, we were kind of hinted that if we just hinted at the fact that you could reverse Alzheimer's, we could sell millions more books. So we can't, it's, it's, um, it's, it's playing with people's hopes. It's unethical. It's unethical, mm -hmm. it's unethical. And, and it's critical that we, we say that you can affect the disease, you can slow it down. And, but even there it's controversial because at that point where a person is in full minute Alzheimer's, I'm talking about full minute Alzheimer's, uh, putting them through all the lifestyle changes might not be something that they might desire. But the bigger factor is that we actually shoot on the higher number as far as prevention. The studies say that about 60% of Alzheimer's can be prevented. Some people say 40%, others say uh, uh, 60%. Given what I told you about high penetrant genes and given what we've seen and all the data, we think as much as 90% of Alzheimer's under ideal, extremely ideal uh, conditions can be prevented. But for a great majority, at least 60% to 70% can be prevented. And, and that's important enough. Prevention is good enough. Or Pre actually pushed back. You or know? pushed back five to 10 years. Yeah. And that's significant. There was a statistics about <clears throat> pushing Alzheimer's disease by five years and the change or the amount of money that we actually save as a society. What was that? The, 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 the burden, both financial and social, would be cut in half if we just pushed the disease five years back. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's... That's that's uh, profound. That's significant. Right now, and we how must much, speak about that. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Right now, how much does it cost us, uh, Alzheimer's disease? So the direct cost. So the costliest, the second costliest disease in America is heart disease at about 120 to 150 billion dollars. For Alzheimer's alone, the direct cost is more than 340 billion. The indirect cost is another 340 billion dollars. Mm. That number should put that's people. Incredible. Uh, 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 that raise attention and raise focus and raise motivation to to do something about this on at the community level, and and this number is rising quickly, and it's expected that by 2040 2050 the direct cost alone will be more than 1.1 trillion dollars, mm -hmm. which will by itself overwhelm our healthcare system. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I think we should talk about uh, the investigations or or the tests that are done to detect um, Alzheimer's disease. Um, let's go ahead and start with uh, maybe some blood tests and then we can go on to cerebrospinal fluid tests and some imaging and what else is needed to uh, <clears throat> detect Alzheimer's disease. So the, although we look at amyloid and tau, and that's usually um, uh, the ratio of that later in the disease and the cerebrospinal fluid, which is a pretty good marker, we don't say that amyloid and tau are the causes of Alzheimer's. The, if, and, and that three to 5% it is, but for a great majority, there are downstream outcomes. 
and and so but but you you can use those as markers anyway mm -hmm. in the cerebral spinal fluid they put a little needle in the lower back draw the fluid and then they can put send it to lab and that ratio tells us that with a fairly great degree of certainty especially if it falls in certain numbers that this person has a high risk of dementia uh, peripheral blood tests for those and other factors are being developed and there are some have been developed already but they have been to be validated where they can actually take your blood and then from that, tell you with a great deal of certainty that if somebody has risk or not. And that is going to be further clarified in the next few years, um, although there are many tests out there. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the other ways that you look at dementia and Alzheimer's risk is um, things like uh, high, high cholesterol, yeah. high sugar, high blood pressure. These things, although they're not direct markers of dementia, we know that they significantly increase your risk of dementia. Absolutely. For example, midlife high blood pressure or midlife uncontrolled high blood One pressure. One of the biggest risk factors. Yeah, a Absolutely. very strong risk factor for yeah. dementia later on in life. And same thing with cholesterols. Uh, as in one study, people who had high LDLs had a 57% increased risk of dementia in a few years thereafter. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing with diabetes. And we did a study, nationwide study on prediabetes. Mm -hmm. And younger people, yeah. and even in that population, cognition was affected. So treating those with medication, yes, we're not against medicine. If there are any individuals out there that think that we should throw away the medicine, that's throwing with the baby out with the bathwater. Medicines have their place, but we think that the 80% of healthcare should be focused on prevention. Pharmaceuticals, medications, all those are great at the point of disease, at the point of symptomology but they're not going to prevent mm -hmm. for a great uh, majority. And and so it should be a combination of those things um, that, that will work. That's amazing, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go oh, ahead. Oh, I forgot. And... Um, oh, sorry. Imaging wise, MRIs will tell you if there are lesions like strokes or shrinkage, particular patterns of shrinkage. Mm -hmm. And PET scans look at metabolism. Yes, PET scans essentially look at how our brain cells consume <laughs> glucose. Now, glucose, as much as you hear that carbs are bad, everybody's saying, oh, glucose shouldn't be good. I was just listening to this podcast and I was, my blood pressure was rising just listening to it. There's this lady who says that glucose levels going high is bad for you without any evidence. In any case, coming back to the point, the most important or the singular <clears throat> uh, food or fuel for our brain cell is glucose. We actually, we live on glucose. And so the PET scan essentially looks at how our brain cells consume glucose. And if it's not consuming glucose, it's more, it basically means that there is some neurodegeneration or some, some, some issues going on with brain cells. And on PET scans, you can actually see yeah. patterns. You can see low glucose intake in the temporal lobe or in the parietal lobe or in the occipital lobe or in the frontal lobe. And based on that, along with a good history, along with blood tests and neuropsychological testing, which is memory testing, you can have a really good diagnosis. A good sense of the diagnosis. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Sorry, good one. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. Let's go ahead and talk about some of the latest treatments that, um, you know, I think we've discussed it in the past on our social media. We're talking about, you know, the MABs, the monoclonal antibodies. You know, what are your thoughts about that? And where are we as far as providing them for, for patients with Alzheimer's disease is concerned? Before we get to these treatments, the medications that we've had before, which is the Aricepts or the Nepazils and, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the Namendas and uh, all these medicines, these are symptomatic dr the drugs, meaning that they don't slow down or stop the disease. They just helped with the symptoms for a few years, but the disease continued. And they were useful for whatever they were. They weren't tremendously powerful, but they're useful. I've, I've given it to some patients and, and many patients, and uh, they have some effect. The newer drugs are about slowing down the disease, and, and most of them had side effects. Mm -hmm. And the side effects were usually small micro bleeds in the brain or swelling of the brain or even death. Um, uh, the latest one, though, uh, seems to have lower side effects, um, uh, um, um, much fewer uh, microbleeds, much much less swelling, and and, and uh, as far as death, I think there were no deaths, but um, and also it slowed down the disease by twenty seven percent or so. It didn't stop the disease; it, it actually slowed it down. And and we're looking long term to see how it, it manifests long term. It does nothing um, lo uh, with advanced disease at this point, at least. We don't know if there's a relation with advanced disease. And we haven't looked at this the drug with people who don't have the disease manifested fully yet. So it, it's something to look at. We're definitely optimistic. We, we don't think that it's going to be the answer because we think it's multifactorial and amyloid is, is just a small part of it. 
Um, but, I, but hopefully there will be better drugs with no side effects or minimal side effects. But in combination with uh, uh, treating the lifestyle factors, such as diabetes, cholesterol, um, uh, uh, and other factors and deficiency states, mm -hmm. then we can do something about this. Absolutely beautiful. S speaking about the deficiency states and, and some of the people that are out there selling their vitamin concoctions in a very, very sophisticated way on TV. That. I'm going to get to that. Should I let you ask no, no, no. them? Uh, they, they, they sell it in a very sophisticated schemes and protocols and all that. Um, the only thing that we know so far, I mean, you can extrapolate all that you want. I mean, that, that's the nature of social media now. It's, it's small data extrapolated beyond their, their weight. And, uh, and uh, in our household, we have two teenagers that are, that are pretty smart. And we say, and the wall is written, we can write on our walls. We say, do not extrapolate beyond the data because the history of human... F uh, 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 a flaw, a human mistake has been extrapolating beyond the data. And, and if you extrapolate beyond the data, we can, we can extrapolate anything from anything. Um, and so um, as far as um, the vitamins that have been shown to be associated with dementia, it's B12 deficiency, mm -hmm. vitamin D, and even that's not uh, dementia, but cognitive uh, uh, consequences, folate, and, and, and then omega-3, not so much as far as deficiency, but there's evidence, and we did the reviews, two massive reviews that we published, that shows that people who are at risk of dementia, when they take uh, omega-3 or they consume enough of it, that their risk goes lower. Absolutely. That's it. Beyond that, it's a phishing scheme. And it's a phishing scheme. They, they do 50 tests. And then whenever you do 50 tests in a population, this is an old grifting technique. An entire population, every single person will have one of the elements that is outside of the normal, just the law of normal distribution. One of the factors, and then they say, oh, there, that's abnormal. You need these four vitamins. Mm -hmm. And then a few months later, and this combination and so forth. So mm -hmm. I, I say this at, at an exhaustive level because that fishing expedition is literally the grifting technique on social media. Yeah, very true. You don't have to pay anybody anything for vitamins or food or the things that we're going to talk about that are preventive in, in Alzheimer's and dementia. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for that, Dean. Um, I think uh, there are specific questions that uh, are about uh, prevention and it uh, kind of comes from the nutrition category, from exercise, a lot of questions about stress. There were so many questions about sleep disorders and Alzheimer's disease risk <clears throat> and uh, some about optimization of cognitive activity. Um, all right, uh, let's go ahead and kind of address some of the nutrition questions. I think you gave a good summary. So um, as far as data about nutrition and Alzheimer's disease prevention is concerned, this is an area where there's a lot of misinformation and um, a lot of myths out there. Um, <laughs> the number of people that contact us about this particular dietary pattern and that particular dietary pattern, or like Sandra's asking about coconut oil. So the data that we have, and we have good data, good enough data, nutrition research is not perfect. Um, and you basically look at multiple lines of research. You look at observational studies, you look at clinical trials, case control studies, even, even some, uh, uh, you know, some, some particular community studies to see how diet affects brain health and how it prevents Alzheimer's disease. And so far, the studies that have helped us understand it better are from those categories. Um, the, the, the dietary pattern that has been associated with lower risk of Alzheimer's disease is the MIND diet, or the it stands for Mediterranean Intervention, Mediterranean Dash Intervention for Neurodegenerative Delay. It's a mouthful, MIND, M-I-N-D. And um, it's essentially a combination of the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. DASH stands for Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. So not to bore you too much, but essentially it's a Mediterranean-like diet and it was uh, created by scientists at Rush University in Chicago, and that has been studied and validated in different populations. And we know that people who adhere to a mind-like diet, they have up to 53% lower risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Well, that's humongous, that's a great number. And when you look at the mind diet, it's essentially highlighting a lot of plant-based foods like greens, beans, cruciferous vegetables, uh, whole grains, nuts, seeds. Um, the fats are from plants, so polyunsaturated fatty acids. And it's also low in saturated fats and sources of saturated fats, which include meats, cheeses, high-fat cheeses, high-fat dairy products. And coconut oil also has high saturated fats, so it really can't be good for you. 
Um, and I know that there's this, there was this movement. Hopefully, that that's one, that I'm, one is that. No, that's pretty much died out now. I do see it pop up o- over uh, and over seven again. Seven billion people, people say, yeah. "What about coconut oil?" Uh, but saturated fats have been associated with increased risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease as well as vascular dementia. So that's what we know. And then as far as like the little it- itty bitty details are concerned, you know, there are certain foods that are good for brain health. Okay, yes, yeah, there's no such thing as superfoods. You know, it it you, your your dietary patterns matter more. So if you're eating greens, beans, whole grains, nuts, seeds, and good sources of you know plant based proteins and polyunsaturated fatty acids, that's the most important thing. Do you want to add anything here? No, that that's basically it. And and the patterns that you hear about, such as ketogenic diet, oh, which yeah. which we it's in our population, in our neurology populations, pediatric seizures, that's where it started. Um, we actually did the review, looked at all the data. None of the data, as much as you would think that there would be so much data out there for something that's ubiquitous and, and has taken over uh, yeah, the, the the media, the the when we go to these airports, there's absolutely one magazine at least talking about ketogenic oh, it's diet. Everywhere. And it's it comes from incredibly short studies, three actually three months mostly, the mm-hmm. and then in small populations. And um, with with outcomes that are nominal to non negligible, yet from that they, this entire story has created because because behind that is the fact that people love hearing good news about their bad habits, and ketogenic diet basically means, especially in young men, it means eating meat, bacon, you know, cheese, things of that nature. And and I say to people, go ahead and eat that, but we can't create. Um, science around our our our, our, our proclivities, yeah. and and so there is no data there. And the more plants you eat, the more variety of plants you eat, data from mind diet, Mediterranean diet, um, advanced health studies, um, uh, uh, the Harvard studies, the Columbia University where you did the work, uh, all of them, including a California teacher study yeah. where you were the main researcher. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, same thing. More plants, more plants, it's, more plants. It's a variation of the same theme. Um, and, you know, um, people can people can do well with different types of dietary patterns as long as <clears> it you know, the main, uh, the main elements are kind of similar to the mind dietary patterns, which are plants, you know, just vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, and seeds. Um, grass-fed beef. Um, I don't think there's any evidence for grass-fed beef uh, being beneficial for brain health than for prevention of Alzheimer's disease. When you look at multiple different studies, whether it's the Mediterranean or the MIND or the DASH diet, the meat component is the least one. They actually, um, you know, it's it's one of the foods that are not recommended and reducing them has been associated with better, uh, better brain health. What kind of plants, like I said, Vegetables, fruits, whole grains, nuts, seeds. Uh, so here's the ma- you want a magic food. I don't Although, think there's such. No, I know. No I'm gonna, I was going to say. Food. So we don't believe in superfood, but if there's anything that comes close, it's just ridiculous that this thing that Popeye had right from beginning. <laughs> uh, so studies have shown that, uh, of course, studies have to be uh, uh, taken for what they are. Um, that uh, greens eating at least a, a heaping serving of greens every day improves your brain health over time. That is improves your brain health by 11 years. Yeah. So foods that are high in anti-inflammatory compounds, you know, whether they are polyphenols or different kinds of flavanols, uh, they're, they're great for you. And greens are one of them. Spinach. Um, blueberries, you know, they've been studied the blueberry itself and blueberry extract has been studied, uh, whether it's short term benefits or long term benefits, they actually are great for brain health. Um, and they've actually studied um, replacing saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats that actually improves brain health too. It's not just avoiding all fats, it's actually avoiding saturated fats with polyunsaturated fats. So eating more nuts and seeds and you know, sources of polyunsaturated fats from oils like s- some extra virgin olive oil those have been associated with better brain health. And I love that Aisha, every time we give talks, she she emphasizes almost militaristically, well, not as much as I, <laughs> that it's not the one food, it's, it's the, the dietary food. pattern. Absolutely. So you could, it's not like you eat blueberries and then go on and eat something fried, um, you know, some uh, heavily fried food. It, it's going to negate that benefit. So yeah. the patterns you follow is more are more important than the one food. Um, so that's the way to look at it. 
Dr. Fix and Bones, thoughts about NAD vitamin drip? No evidence whatsoever. No evidence. We actually have a, a, a post on NAD. You may want to take a look at that as well, but drips, no. <laughs> I want to talk about glucose uh, and carbohydrates because um, a low carbohydrate diet and a ketogenic diet has been you know, promoted as a good dietary pattern for brain health. You want to say something? Yeah, the evidence. I, I want to kind of emphasize that. So if you want to find a paper in PubMed, you will find the paper on anything. You will find somebody somewhere that wrote a paper and found their peer reviews. By the way, the lower impact journals, they don't even have their peer reviewers. They ask you to provide them their peer reviewers. So you could be your cousin and your uncle that reviews your paper. Yeah. So the impact score of the journal matters. But, and especially animal studies, 400 stud drugs worked on animal and Alzheimer's, mice and Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. none of them translated to humans. Sure. So mice studies and Petri dish studies and all of these mean nothing. 400 drugs worked on mice, yeah. but none of them translated to humans. So the, the weight of the study, the, the repeatability of the study and how it has been translated to humans, not just by one person, because even there they can, uh, they can finagle with it, but other third parties were able to reproduce that data is critical. If there's anything that I would love our audience to kind of learn is to look at the data in that light. Because otherwise we're every day, we're going to fight over that one other paper that came and that paper that came. And, uh, but not, the, yeah. the, but the, it's the it's the the totality of the research, the weight of the data, mm -hmm. where it was published, how it was published, who was it funded by, and was it all most importantly was it repeated by a third party and a fourth party and a fifth party that had no connections with them? Then we have confidence, and we have that for 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 food and brain, more plants. We have it for simple magical exercise. Yeah, a, a brisk walk. Yeah, absolutely. I'm smiling because Easy Breezy said repeatability is king. And I, I yes. agree with you. Repeatability <laughs> is king. I love that. I love that. Okay. All right. I uh, wanted to say, I want to talk about glucose. Yes, um, Sorry, I did talk to you. Oh, it's okay. It was, it, was, it was an important point to kind of link with what you were saying earlier. Um, carbohydrates are not the enemy. It's very important for us to understand that. This low-carb ketogenic diet that's being promoted on social media Believe it or not, even though they're promoted by very, very famous MDs, you know, people who actually have an MD uh, or, you know, claim to be scientists. Or um, claim to be famous. Or claim to be famous and good looking. <laughs> <laughs> claim, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's really no evidence for that. Um, of course, managing carbohydrates when somebody has diabetes is incredibly important or pre-diabetes for that matter. But to wear a glucose monitor and not allow for your you glucose level. You hate that level, glucose monitor. It, I mean, there's no evidence for it. I hate it because yeah. it's being promoted as the thing to have it's, to it's control a, it's a, your it's health. A, it's Why? a cool little gimmick. Yeah. yeah. It, there's really no evidence for that. And when you look at the healthiest people with, you know, lower risk of Alzheimer's disease and dementias in general, well, I'll just speak about uh, Alzheimer's disease because there are other types of dementias that people can't do anything about. But when you look at their dietary patterns, it consists of complex carbohydrates, right? Of course, we're going to differentiate between complex and simple. So whole wheat is much, much better than white flour. Um, brown rice is much better than white rice, although I like white rice. Um, you know, uh, whole wheat pasta is much better than regular pasta. So it's it's important for us not to kind of throw away the entire category of carbohydrates away. And um, wanted to add a little bit about ketogenic diet. We're not against you know a, a dietary pattern if the time comes when we have enough data that shows that ketogenic indeed does help brain health say for example lowers risk of alzheimer's disease or other types of dementia by all means that data will rule our conversations we're going to be the first ones recommending it to our patients but we don't have that data yet and, and, and the two of us are very very rigidly data driven and that's uh, and that's why we don't fit any uh, any group we ourselves are plant-based, whole food plant-based um, for multiple reasons. But when it comes, for example, to fish, fatty fish, we say today there's no evidence that it's bad for you. In fact, there's some evidence that it's good for you. But we think that whatever benefit that that is conferred, potentially conferred from fish, you can get from other ways, from chia flaxseed or, 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 or just um, uh, pills. Yeah. Um, so it's critical to go by data. I mean supplements. Right? Supplements, yeah. yes. Yeah, not, yeah, <laughs> supplements. I love it that once in a while, all of a sudden somebody says sex. Or, or 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 marijuana. Somebody flipped us off too, but was, yeah, that's a live session. In any yeah, case. Yes, yes, I love it. I love it. <laughs> okay, yeah. all right. Um, 
So, so that's basically it for nutrition. I think we can move on. And, and we're so science-based that, you know, we're so evidence-based that, you know, even though we are on a plant-based diet ourselves, like we, we don't eat any animal products, um, we are not, we're not going to actually create stories about dietary pattern that fits our narrative. Um, and so we're, we're going to be very, very um, aware of that. Okay. Well, let's is, go ahead. Yeah. So, sorry? No, go ahead. All right. Let's go ahead and take some questions from uh, the audience as well. Now, I have this one question from Marianne, and she wants to know about sleep, the role <clears throat> of sleep in Alzheimer's disease. Yes. So uh, sleep is profoundly important for your brain. In fact, the sleep was uh, the byproduct, evolutionary byproduct of, of, of sleep, uh, of the brain. Mm -hmm. this, this, this little brain, uh, three pounds, 2% of your body's weight consumes 25% or more of your body's energy, as much as 50% of your oxygen at times. And um, so it's overwhelmed and, and the sleep is, is there so that the brain can recover. It has two main functions, probably much more, but two main functions, which is cleansing and memory consolidation. The cleansing takes place in many, many different ways, actually remarkable ways. The brain actually shrinks, creates space for lymphatic flow, which is cleansing the fluid that actually flows and cleans. The gl uh, glial cells actually go in and uh, almost like uh, these um, late night um, uh, uh, janitorial, janitorial system cleans the brain. Team. Uh, unbelievably yeah. every night there's a clean. I love the lymphatic system. I think it's so <laughs> fascinating. It, it, cl it cleans. And then the other function is memory consolidation. We know that people who sleep well, have good sleep patterns, have significant and con against controls, against all the variables that you take into consideration when you do controls, they have significantly better memory. So investing in your sleep hygiene, investing in your sleep environment, investing in your sleep is critically important. And sleep cannot be short circuited or uh, there are no short circuits for or short paths uh, um, uh, for uh, sleep. You have to invest. You have to go into bed and wake up the bed uh, in the morning, same time. Pattern recognition is what the brain lives around. So when it recognizes that, oh, it's 10 o'clock, I have to go to sleep. It's, it's um, uh, seven o'clock, I have to wake up. That pattern will tell it after time that it that's the sleep time, that's wake up time. That's going to actually trigger the melatonin going up. The, the cortisol going down, the serotonin system coming into effect. So pattern recognition. It's not about what foods to eat to sleep better. It's about not to eat right before sleep because then especially fatty foods, especially high sugar foods, especially alcohol, because it actually revs up the system. Alcohol doesn't rev up the system, but it affects the depth of sleep. All of these things are critical to know. And, and it takes a little more time to create a sleep spa, a sleep environment that cleanses the brain we we do so much trickery and games and and pay for this and that for uh, uh for cleansing and 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 washing the system mm -hmm. your most important cleanse happens when you sleep Absolutely. so invest in your sleep and i wanted to talk a little bit about wearable devices you know the um the apple watches and um some of the other uh brands that provide information about our sleep pattern. Um, so most of them, the most important element of any wearable device is movement. Um, and some of them actually can measure, um, does it measure, there are some of them that measure uh, oxygen saturation, right? So you can actually connect that, that's rare, but but at that's least rare. pulse, that right. can be, yeah. So it detects movement and pulse, but uh, a lot of them extrapolate beyond the data that they're getting as far as your depth of sleep is concerned. Um, sure, movement is uh, related or correlated with the depth of your sleep, but don't rely fully on those wearables to tell you whether you're going to to the deeper stages of sleep or not. And if you have, this is very important, if you feel like you have some sleep disorders, which essentially feels like, you know, the next morning, when you wake up in the morning, you're tired, or you have a headache, or if your partner who sleeps with you hears you snore, or you have restless leg syndrome, or you fall asleep in front of the, you know, an, a lecture or a TV, or you can't read a book and you fall asleep, or you're feeling tired most of the time, it's very important to get evaluated. And sleep studies are, I mean, I wouldn't call them easy, but they're available and the insurance covers it. And your doctor should be able to put in a referral for you. You go to a lab, they connect you to a band around your chest to check your breathing patterns, a pulse off, <clears throat> uh, you know, some EEG uh, leads to look at your brain waves. 
and a microphone to hear you, uh, you know, uh, snore. And it gives you a beautiful, elaborate uh, uh, test result, and you can find out whether you have sleep ap apnea or not, which is so important to rule out. Yeah, because sleep apnea has been associated with a significant increased risk of dementia, and it's something that's treatable. Now, I understand CPAP machines are a instrument mm -hmm. of torture for many. I understand that, but almost everybody gets used to them. And more importantly, if you don't wear them, it means that every night that you have sleep apnea, you're yeah. damaging the brain. Oxygen levels falls down. Mm -hmm. Oxygen level falls down for peripherally. Imagine what's happening to the most hungry organ in the body, the Absolutely. brain. So that's critical to get it treated. And also uh, there's a notion that people who are overweight, they tend to have sleep apnea. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to people who are not overweight. It could be an anatomical issue. You know, the back of your tongue is so thick that it actually falls on your throat. And or it tissue you. redundancy. Tissue redundancy, shorter, shorter neck, uh, you know, more uh, more tissue in, your, in somebody's chest. That can actually cause obstructive sleep apnea as well. So there's so many reasons. And that is such a wonderful way of making sure that we all have a better uh, brain health. And, and it's a treatable thing. It is a treatable thing. And there was one study from University of Florida that showed that people who have untreated sleep apnea had a 70% higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. So that's a very, very yeah. modifiable risk factor. Great. What do you think about sleep medication, Dean? I'm not against any of the medications, whether it's for diabetes, short term, um, um, absolutely. Blood pressure, definitely. Uh, diabetes, definitely. Uh, cholesterol, definitely. Because by the time lifestyle takes over, I mean, you could be damaging a lot of neurons. Uh, the same thing with sleep medication, but they shouldn't be a long term strategy. Yeah. The strategy should be to use those short term, but institute lifestyle factors that can reverse, reduce, and alter those risks so that you don't need you need less and less and less of those so that then you can actually truly reverse the disease process yeah. not um, uh, use a band-aid or equivalent um, to uh, to mollify the the problem absolutely that's beautiful all right my favorite topic that you discussed in is um cognitive activity so i got worried there a little bit okay. <laughs> you talk beautifully about other things too but cognitive activity or building cognitive reserve. It's one of those things that um, usually kind of gets brushed off, especially on social media, because it's so easy to tell people to eat blueberries and, you know, just like focus on spinach or, you know. Or, or on the other side, weird stuff like eat bone broth. Or ashwagandha. ashwagandha. Yeah, There's yeah. no evidence of ashwagandha, actually. They did a clinical Or even turmeric, which we did the research for. It's great, right. but it's not the total solution. Right, but... Uh, rarely talk about challenging themselves and putting themselves in in s good stressful situations where their brain essentially grows their brain makes those important connections the neuroplasticity the concept of neuroplasticity comes to the surface can you talk to us about that what do we know about building cognitive reserve and as as regular you know individuals living our lives with our children and family members what does it look like on a day-to-day -day basis? So we have basically coined and trademarked and live by the neuro concept. It's self-serving neuro, but neuro is nutrition, exercise, unwind, which is stress management, restorative sleep, and optimizing mental and social activity. The, and the center is you, which is stress management, not stress reduction. Actually, I believe in stress increase more than stress reduction because those are two different kinds of stress we're talking about. Of course, the word play, but it's challenging the brain is good stress. But when you are actually involved in behaviors, thoughts, and emotions that are not driven by your purpose, that are, don't have clear timelines, that don't have clear process, it creates a sympathetic overdrive that becomes your baseline. Uh, it's the equivalent of you running away from the tiger and continually feeling this anxiety, this stress, and the cortisol levels are higher. The, the sympathetic response throughout the body is, is one of... Um, uh, uh, fight or flight or reserve as opposed to growth and, and reproduction and, and restoration. That's critical to take control of. That's something we talk about more than anything else, as much as we have degrees in nutrition and all that. But without stress management, none of those things will happen. Absolutely. You'll jump from diet to diet, from product to product, from uh, exercise program to exercise program. Stress reduction, identify the bad stressors in your life. The activities, behaviors, and thoughts that are not, and emotions that are not driven by your purpose. The, what is purpose? Things that are really making you, um, um, makes you wake up in the morning. The things that you want to do, the things that make you happy as far as 
activities are concerned that that have a purpose and uh, 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 and and build processes around that S build small steps of success towards that that's the habit component um the bad the uh, uh, the bad stress are the things that are not driven and you reduce eliminate and and delegate those those behaviors um, so that's basically it good stress you build you increase in systematic ways bad stress you reduce and eliminate in systematic ways now there's a third category things that you can't do anything about mm. that's where your internal language comes in where how you use the internal language in a negative way throughout the day or a positive way driven by your good purposes which overwhelm the negative stress yes, absolutely. and this is you know as much as we talk about stress, this is as real as tangible as mathematical as anything else because without this the stress will overwhelm your brain um it will affect your sleep it will affect your diet it will affect your um, your your uh, other patterns as well and it will shrink your brain studies have shown that people who have chronic stress have smaller brains absolutely Beautifully stated, Dean. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, an important concept that uh, needs to be discussed is whenever we talk about Alzheimer's disease, right, or dementia, uh, younger people and even people during their midlife don't really don't really take it seriously, or at least it, it, they feel that it doesn't really apply to th to them, right? So, for example, if somebody is, say, in their 30s or early 40s, and they're doing really well, and they're exercising, and they're living a very, you know, a, 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 a cognitively vibrant life, why do they need to be involved in this conversation about Alzheimer's disease? Why is it important for younger people to know about it? And uh, if you could kind of explain some of that, because a lot of questions are related yes. to that as well. Um, because as if, if the younger person is in a growth minded state, somebody who wants to do more things, they want to do, do uh, activities that really make them grow to succeed at work, to succeed at, at, at their sport, uh, to succeed at anything they want to do. It's absolutely impossible for them to do so if they're not going to be able to have a clear mind and control over their focus, control over their cognition, because uh, and what happens is, I'm not even talking about the damage that takes place, and I'll speak about that in a minute. What happens is if you're not getting good sleep, if you're eating poor food, which is uh, high sugar, high fat, that revs you up, but doesn't allow the focus levels to come to the deepest level where the brain opens up to creativity, the mm -hmm. brain opens up to uh, to, um, uh, to to memory building, the brain opens up to growth mindedness. You're not experiencing those things, and you don't know that you're not experiencing those things because when you are in a given state, you don't know the alternate state. When you are constantly in a semi anxious state, in a semi hyper driven state, when you're constantly driven by sugar, by the fat, by when you're constantly driven by the fact that you you you're not getting good sleep, so therefore you're you're not able to create that mental state of focus and attention and cognition and creativity. You that becomes your baseline. Mm. The alternative is if you're a twenty year old, even younger, or twenty or thirty, you're eating healthy so that you're not your brain is not in that protective state sure. and it's in a parasympathetic growth state mm. and these are not magical terms these are actual physiological concepts yeah. and and your brain is actually a recovery state your brain is in a growth state not de defending itself against trauma uh, the four horsemen that i call inflammation oxidation glucose dysregulation and lipid dysregulation when it's not always fighting those it's actually growing and then once that's happening then your focus becomes better. Add to that some meditation and mindfulness that you bring into your life. And then creativity comes to the surface. And add to that good sleep. And that actually opens up all of your cognitive capacity beyond what you could imagine. These, these are simple things. You don't have to buy some pills or some, some uh, uh, vitamins that, that all these big names are selling. It's simple things such as eating more plants, eating less sugar. Carbs are fine. Eating less fat, uh, uh, polyunsaturated fats in small amounts are fine. Um, it, it, making sure that you exercise significantly. The, um, the, the effect of exercise on mm -hmm. anti-apoptogenesis, which is death of cells, on anti-inflammation, on ox uh, oxidation, on BDNF, VGF. These are things that grow the vascularity of the brain. We, we have a podcast on that yeah. as well as a blog right now that just, just, just came out. Uh, how it affects um, uh, the vascularity, the, the growth of neurons, the connectivity. We have 87 billion neurons 
and each of them can make a few connections or as many as 30 to 50,000 connections. You can't get to those numbers if you don't do these basic things. Mm -hmm. And exercise has a huge part in that. Stress management has a huge part in that. Sleep and a restful sleep, that's why we call it restorative sleep, has a humongous part of that. And then the last one, which is challenge your brain around your passions. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sudoku and, and those things are fine, but learn a musical instrument, take classes that you always wanted, um, uh, learn a new language, volunteer, which is our favorite thing, um, um, have conversations with people around challenging concepts. These kind of things grow your brain. Um, and between these things, younger people, you, they will notice that their brain becomes much sharper, much more creative, much more open to out of the box thinking. That's the positive side. The negative is your brain is a bank account that has these pillars, these things that are holding it up. And every time when you're younger, you're eating poorly or you have a head trauma or you don't sleep well, some of the pillars are, are knocked out. When you're young, you're not noticing it. The building's still standing. More pillars, more pillars. More. And then in your 50s and 60s, you start having memory issues. Guess what? You're knocking down a lot of pillars now. You can rebuild it even at that point. But there's a point where there's enough pillars that are knocked out that the building can't stand by itself anymore. It starts earlier. That's the time to build the pillars. That's the time to build the bank account or what they call cognitive reserve. So that's uh, why um, young people have to start thinking about it early. Beautifully stated. Okay, we're going to close, but uh, let's do a fun uh, exercise. Yes. So there were so many questions that said, what is, if there's one thing that you should do for brain health, what would it be? I usually try to shy away from those questions, but we'll just make it fun. Okay? I'll make, I'll say one, you say one. Yeah. So, so um, <clears throat> I asked you first, so you go. Okay. Something that I've actually become very, um, I'm focusing on it more and more. Why? Because so many people don't do this thing because of all the limitations of space, resources, time, and everything else. And I think this one workaround is going to be revolutionary. So exercise for me is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. You have to get tired at least 30 minutes a day or more. Yeah, and, and, and leg strength is critical. So, and people say, I don't have space, I don't have time. So I say, pick one show. And we do this in our communities. Pick one show that you love. Now that show that every day, during that show, you're gonna stand and do steps and have a counter that counts your steps or counter to yourself or, or just guesstimate a few if that's too much. But that becomes your, by just that one public health revolution, if we start walk in space revolution, you can say, share as I said this, spread it up. We will, we will change healthcare more than anything else out there. Uh, so to me, something as simple of that, yeah, if you can go out and walk, that's great. If you can run, that's great. If you can bike and swim and all that, that's great. But for the rest of us, if let's say one day you can't do it, that exercise of working out and walking in space and in, in place during a show will change healthcare by itself profoundly. That's my one magic thing. Caroline is here and she says, better legs, better brain. Yes, <laughs> bigger legs, bigger brains. That's right. Yes, yes. All right, my turn. Um, okay, so as, uh, as a woman, as a mom, I have an 18 year old and a 16 year old and I have a lovely family to take care of and I'm in my early forties. As, so, as a you know, leader, as a oh, magnificent being. All right, I love you. Uh, so, you know, as someone who's actually going through this whole stage of, you know, getting myself ready for that transition that women go through during their 40s and 50s, um, I think I'm realizing more, op absolutely, I'm with you. You stole my, uh, I, I was going to say exercise, but one of the things that most women try to uh, try to brush off because our lives are so complex is cognitive activity. Mm -hmm. I've become a big believer of becoming comfortable with complex conversations and complex cognitive uh, activities. So, you know, digging deeper into a conversation, learning new information on a regular basis, taking classes, uh, learning not, a new language, learning a new language, not getting yourself busy in, in laundry and cleaning the house too much, doing things that really challenge your mind and making that a habit for the rest of your life is so important, um, especially for women. I think that is going to build cognitive reserve and resilience, uh, more connections with, between brain cells. So, you know, that would be, that would be my choice. I love it. 
Awesome. Well, um, this is basically it. You can uh, check out our blogs on our website, thebraindocs.com. Please check out our podcast, The Brain Health Revolution, for so many different topics on Alzheimer's disease prevention and the latest advances in the research of Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative uh, diseases. So those are the two things that I want you guys to check out. Our website, thebraindocs.com, and our podcast, The Brain Health Revolution. I'm so proud to say that we're always in the top 50 of all science podcasts in the world. Um, and you will hear this brilliant man uh, oh, yeah. talk about so many amazing things that are happening. I know I'm the face on, on Instagram <laughs> on most of the reels, but you know, I think you're going to really I, I, love you can the see why that's nuance the and the complex conversation that this beautiful man has in our podcast. So please check it out and let us know. Uh, and if you like it, we would love for you guys to kind of give us a good review because that's how it's going to reach to, to a lot of people. Yep. Stay tuned with us. Thank you so much for joining us. We love you all. I really appreciate all of the lovely messages that you send us all the time. Please know that we read them all the time and we're just so happy to be connected with you all. Please take good care of yourselves and help us spread this message of hope about prevention of such a devastating disease and also help us be science-based and evidence-based and help us fight against misinformation. And hold us accountable as well. Absolutely. We always say uh, the number of degrees that we have means nothing. I know that they say we have more degrees than a thermostat. It means <laughs> nothing. That what, what, what matters is the next word that comes out of our mouth. Yes. Is it science-based? Is it, is it valid? And are we putting the right weight on it? So please hold us accountable and hold others accountable to that. Absolutely. Love you guys. Thank you so much Love for joining. Bye.